Well, it's great to be back uh, in the metaverse, but here nonetheless. Uh, I think I've attended Focus Right at least 20 times, and there's no way I could start this year without giving a shout out to my dear friend, Philip Wolf. Philip loved giving me a hard time about the year that I went on stage with Joel Cutler wearing a black fur vest. So in his honor this year, I broke out my blinky white vest um, and uh, certainly thinking of Philip. And I know one thing that he loved more than anything uh, was the intersection of venture and travel, all things internet travel. So I'm thrilled today to be breaking Brad and participating yet again um, with a dear friend of mine, Anu Hariharan, um, who's a key partner at YC, um, which is a, 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 a just prolific early stage investor in Silicon Valley. So I thought we'd break down today into three sections to keep things moving about 10 minutes each, and then we'd kick it over to questions. The first section really just start about YC, the startup ecosystem, and the changing industrial landscape of VC. Maybe secondly, Anu, we could talk about just post-pandemic world and what travel looks like in a post-pandemic world, startup opportunities you're seeing to respond to that. And then third, something everybody's talking about, the metaverse, both centralized, decentralized, the impact that blockchain is having on, on the world of travel and tourism. But to kick, to kick it off, why don't you just tell us a little bit about YC, how you came to YC, and the role YC plays in the venture community today. Happy to. Well, first of all, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, Brad. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, so let me, I mean, I think most of you probably are very familiar with YC. YC is actually 16 years old. Uh, it's well known as the best accelerator in the world. It was launched by Paul, Jessica, Robert, and Trevor 16 years ago to help founders start companies. Um, and since then, YC has really evolved. Uh, so we invest, you know, the accelerator basically is like a university program for startups. So we get 15,000 applications each batch and we accept around 300 companies per batch. We've funded more than 3,000 companies globally. So 6,000 to 7,000 founders wow. as part of the YC community. I help lead uh, the YC Growth Fund along with Ali Rogani, which we launched six years ago. So that's a new initiative within YC. So now YC doesn't stop at the batch. Uh, we actually uh, invest in companies all the way to IPO. So the growth fund that we help lead invests primarily in Series B and above. Um, and it has invested in a lot of companies that you're familiar with. But YC's portfolio includes Airbnb. It was one of the first companies to go through YC in 2009, uh, IPO'd last year, and I just checked the market cap today. Uh, it's around 130 billion. <laughs> we surely didn't know that in 2009. And so I think YC's mission has always been help founders start companies and help them build enduring companies. So Anu, you know, YC was not the first uh, incubator. They weren't the first accelerator. In fact, I remember you know, really in 2006, 2007, there was a negative halo mm -hmm. associated with going to an incubator, right? Like you would want to go to Sequoia, you'd want to go to General Catalyst, they would incubate your companies. What changed? What allowed Paul to build something that, you know, really had negative halo in the venture industry and make it become such an iconic kind of community and membership? Yeah, so great question. I think that, uh, you know, Paul Graham, one of the founders of YCs, he maintained a blog where he really talked about his own experiences of starting a startup at the age of 23, 25, 27. If you look back um, and then reflect on what happens after engineering, when a student graduates from engineering, they typically went to established companies. They didn't go to startups. And it always intrigued PG because he was, he, his whole mission was why aren't more company, uh, more people starting companies when they graduate from college? Because honestly, you're 23 and 24 and it's the lowest risk. And most of these venture capitalist firms did not invest in the 23 to 25 year old. So if you look at YC's cohort, uh, especially the earliest cohort of companies, most of our founders are one to two years out of school. 
And the program, the 12 week program that we put them through really is very simple. It teaches only three things, write code, focus, launch. And these founders didn't have a chance before YC. To this day, that's true. In fact, Brad and I were just talking about that right before this session. Most people think, well, why should, you know, why, why does someone have to go through YC? Why not go straight to venture, especially given so many more venture firms have been created in the last decade. Um, I, to, to this day, the majority of people YC funds didn't have a shot of raising from any VC fund. They get a shot because they went through YC. So if you think about the founder who's dropping out from high school or who's in college or graduated from college two years after you know, working at a company, YC is still the best shot at starting a company. Um, so today you do one or two batches a year, Anu? Two batches a year. So two batches a year, 600 companies a year are coming through uh, YC. How many of those companies go on? What percentage of that 600 goes on to get Series A funding? So we have actually looked at the, the data varies by batch, but roughly 30 percent of them end up raising a Series A. And the odds of, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest failure point is between, you know, graduating from the batch and getting to the Series A. The post Series A, usually you have a much higher odds of success, especially if you have strong product market fit. So what if you looked at the first cohort of companies and you compared it to the cohorts today, what would you say um, has changed the most in terms of uh, YC's ownership as it progresses through the ecosystem? So my impression, I'll just share this with you. My impression is like in those early batches of YC, again, there was still a little bit of a negative halo. People weren't sure what YC was all about. Now it's a feeding frenzy. Every venture capital firm is trying to get the early look even before demo day. You know, I'm sure there are a bunch of like, you know, texts that you're getting. Hey, can you hook me up with such and such founder? We have rounds of financing getting done before the demo day. So they haven't even really completed YC and they're getting the funding. So talk to us a little bit about this frenzy and what it means to you and YC growth as these companies grow and scale through uh, through Silicon Valley ecosystem? Yeah, so I think that there are, it's a great question. And I would say there are uh, two lenses we use, which is, you know, are we, um, I mean, one of the questions we often get asked is why are you scaling your batches? Aren't 700 companies large enough? And if you ask Paul Graham, he would say, Harvard Business School has figured out how to admit 900 to 1,000 amazing people every year, and YC is still at 700. So it's all in the lens you look at. So the question we ask ourselves is, are there 1,000 amazing founders starting companies every year globally? And the answer to that is yes. So therefore, YC needs to scale because we need to find a way to support them. That's our mission. Our mission, actually, we were never established as an investment fund, so we never measure or focus on, I mean, of course, returns happen. Oh, come on, you you don't don't, don't focus on the money. You don't care about the money. Yeah, so for us, it's the mission of funding more founders. So if you look at the batches from 2009 versus today, our, our applications have gone up dramatically since the first batch to today. Today, we receive more than 15,000 applications per batch. Our acceptance rates have actually gone down dramatically. And But if you look at uh, the data set, what's different from, so one, there are just way more founders starting amazing companies everywhere in the world. I mean, close to 50% of our batches are outside the US now. So you have founders from India, founders from Latin America. I mean, YC funded Rappi, which is one of the first startups that's scaling really well in Latin America. YC funded RazorPay, YC funded Misho in India. YC has funded Ajayib and Zended in Indonesia. So we've actually enabled a lot of founders to start really successful companies globally. So one, just the variety of applications have increased. Second, you know, you could say that uh, the first version of YC, the earlier cohorts, looked a lot like consumer startups. You had Airbnb, you had DoorDash, you had Instacart. Today, more than 40% of our batch is B2B software, given the very nature of B2B software. But there is another significant advantage they get. Now the YC community has 6,000 founders, 3,000 companies, adding 700 companies a year. So they get customers pretty much from day one. 
you know, uh, at the start, when Brex launched in winter 2017, for the first two years, 60% of their customer volume was YC companies. So it so helped I would, so, yeah. I would say that to me, the, the most remarkable feature is that YC is not actually an incubator, it's a social network. And it's one of the most exclusive membership clubs in the startup world. And, you know, it's extraordinary the, the level of dedication, devotion YC founders have to each other to answer questions, et cetera. And most often when I talk to somebody and ask them, why did you go through YC? Aside from the signaling effect to the venture community that you've been, you know, it's kind of like getting a credential from Harvard Business School. But the second thing is really that founder community uh, you know, that you guys have nurtured and built. I think it's, I think it's really extraordinary. Let me shift gears for a second here. Um, if you think about um, just venture valuations today, right? Um, I want to spend, you know, just a couple of minutes. The world seems frenzied. You know, we started 2020, less than two years ago. We thought the world was ending. Um, interest rates went to zero. Liquidity spiked. Trillions of dollars in the global ecosystem. And now we've had this really just explosion in terms of financing activity all throughout the venture ecosystem. Can you just riff for a second on, you know, like, what are you seeing? What's the consequence of it? Is dumb stuff getting funded? Are we, you know, in the proverbial bubble again? Um, you know, how, how do you- We've been talking about a bubble for a long time, so- <laughs> There you go. So, so, so share with us your thoughts. Yeah, I think that um, there are a few, as you touched on, Brad, there are a few trends. There are a lot more funds investing in startups. And so you're definitely seeing way more supply of capital. I mean, just to give you an example, the batch demo day, we have 350 companies, but 2,100 investors. So wow. there's definitely way more supply of capital than there are companies to be funded. So you're seeing that. Um, so the manifestation of that is too. Uh, I think also liquidity has been amazing last two years. The tech IPOs have been hugely successful. I mean, DoorDash was another $70 billion IPO, which is a YC company. Airbnb was $130 billion. So you're also seeing returns because these uh, people have realized that tech company is no longer just purely software-based. It's pervasive across industries, and it has the opportunity to have monopolistic share. So it's no longer underwriting to a five or $10 billion outcome, you're able to write to a $50, $100 billion outcome, right? So if you put those two lenses together, you can see why more funds are interested in investing in tech, why more hedge funds are interested in investing in startups. It makes complete sense. But what are we advising the batch? This is going to be contrary to what you're hearing. We tell our batch companies not to raise in, until demo day and to actually raise the least amount of money in this market. Here's why. If we have 16 years of history, the single thing that differentiates a company that's extremely successful versus the company that's kind of gone sideways or mediocre outcome, one of the key elements, not the main, but one of the key elements is the amount of cash they had very early on. If you have too much cash, you don't really end up narrowing the focus and you don't have that same grit of perseverance across your team to really narrow the focus and execute to the level that you need as you scale. So DoorDash, they couldn't raise a demo day. Coinbase could not raise a demo day. The YC partners self-funded the company themselves to keep the companies alive. But that taught them amazing grit and rigor. And so today, one of the concerns we have is there is, of course, a lot of capital. But if you haven't got that product market fit and you still don't have 1,000 users that love you, we don't want you to scale your team too ahead of progress because it can actually hinder progress. So that's the advice we're giving in the bad. So I think um, given most companies are able to raise with very little effort, that's a concern we have. We don't know how much of them will actually use the money towards, you know, be lean and still use it towards execution. Then in the growth stage, there is a different problem, which you touched on, valuations. Um, and I think the valuations, of course, the public markets also reacted to valuations where the enterprise software valuations are at a premium, but I just think the private market valuation is way out of whack right now. And so one of the, uh, you know, advice or pointers we give our founders is 
you know, when you're raised, it's very easy to raise right now. You know, premium companies that were executing really well always commanded a premium valuation. And what we are seeing is those companies are still getting the same premium multiple they would in, let's say, what, uh, in 2016 or 2017 when Uber got that or Instacart got that or DoorDash. But what's happening is lots of companies are getting premium valuations, whether it's warranted or not. And so the advice we're giving them is make sure that you can walk into the valuation. Because if you're not able to raise for three or four years, guess what it's going, how it's going to impact you. Number one, hiring. Like it or not, today, being a unicorn is no longer that great. There are like hundreds of unicorns. So how are you going to attract the talent market? You have to show consistent progress. And unfortunately, the one proxy for consistent progress is valuation and markups. And if you raise at a very high valuation, you may not be able to raise for a couple of years, and that really hurts you as a company. And so I do think it's really important that founders use that lens in making sure that you know, their company is getting valued from strength to strength, because that's the only proxy in the private markets. Yeah, I, you know, it, to me, it's, um, you know, over the last 20 years, I, I saw Steve Hafner on earlier, I think about when he came to, you know, work with Joel Cutler and, and General Catalyst and Incubate Kayak. I mean, there's no YC incubator at, at that point in time. Um, but but Steve helped get orbits off the ground, did the same thing again with Kayak. And I, I mean, the dollars that you were talking about, the capital efficiency they did it with was just extraordinary relative to what founders are looking at today. If I think about the, you know, a new, you know, these growth rounds that we're talking about, the entire venture capital industry in 2000 um, was basically, uh, you know, all the money that had been raised is about the same amount that was raised last year, right? I think about the distributions from the industry this year, the distributions from venture capital this year, over 300 billion, which is larger than the entire industry was 15 years ago. Um, and so my own observation is, you know, Tiger's deploying over $10 billion a year uh, into what we call venture, Co2 over uh, six or seven billion, you know, Altimeter, my firm, you know, uh, four, four billion dollars a year. Like we have all 10 x our own deployment because of this secular curve, which I think is very steep, i.e. companies are scaling faster and more capital efficiently than they've ever scaled before. All of these companies are uh, have much bigger outcomes because they can sell to 4 billion consumers on the internet or sell to every single customer that sits on AWS. Uh, but certainly we're dealing with premium multiples today. And I do see a lot of average companies fetching those premium multiples that I think will lead to some indigestion. Uh, but maybe we shift gears here for a second um, and talk a little bit about um, you know, the, the post-pandemic world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, Rich Barton, who is a, a favorite for many years of this conference, um, ha has been talking a lot uh, over the last you know, six months about what he calls Cloud HQ. This idea that there is no, there's no longer a physical headquarters for a company. There is a cloud headquarters. I think Hafner was just trying, you know, had a recruiting video on before this, where he's saying, you know, we're we're hiring. We don't care where you live, like live and work anywhere. Um, talk to us about what you see the impact of that on the YC ecosystem, like companies that are building virtually, and what you think the consequence of that is on, you know, businesses that are being built to, to service this new, uh, this new kind of global setup? Yeah, so I think there are quite a few changes and I would also caveat saying we will still learn as we go, right? Because we have not returned to a fully post-pandemic world to see what is going to work versus not. Um, I think that from, and there are different lenses we can take, but from a company standpoint, obviously companies have made the choice of uh, all, pretty much majority of YC companies have made two choices. Either they're gonna be completely remote first, which largely means the entire leadership team and the company is really encouraging more employees to be remote and not necessarily have an office space. And the second option is hybrid. I don't know of any company that's pretty much said all in person, except the younger companies, which are less than 10 or 20 employees do. And I think that there is a reason why they need to, and I'll touch on that. But the remote first, I think that companies that have been able to crack that 
will have one of the biggest advantages in the post-pandemic world. Because we've, we may have solved a lot of, like tech is everywhere. It's much easier to start a company today. It's much easier to raise money today. But what we haven't solved is human capital. We are still resource constrained. A company can raise $500 million, but if they can't double their team, they are not gonna ship half the features that they wanna ship. And the human capital is a real problem. So I think remote first companies are, I'm seeing, have a significant advantage, especially with engineering, product, and design hiring. Uh, engineers overwhelmingly want remote. They, right. do, they do not want to walk into the office. They don't want to, it's definitely not five days a week. And preferably, they want to go and spend in different parts of the world, but be able to work from anywhere. You know, and you, I think we hear about this from every quarter. I mean, Brian Chesky on the Airbnb call talks about just the long-term stays, right? The, the, this nature of, you know, I can work from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I may choose to spend two months in three or four different locations over the course of the year. And most likely you're going to be, you know, getting that accommodation from Airbnb. Um, so tons of software tools companies, Miro, Loom, um, you, you know, obviously Zoom and many, many others that are purpose-built for the, you know, this new world. Um, I'm wondering if you're seeing any other, you know, kind of patterns. I know one of your uh, uh, fun investments that you and I've talked a lot about because I love airplanes uh, was your investment in Boom Supersonic, um, the first, I think, uh, supersonic investment in, you know, in, in many decades. Tell us a little bit about Boom and other maybe travel related startups that you're seeing that, that support, you know, a world that's going to uh, include a lot more travel in the future. Yeah, um, I wish Boom could fly a jet this year because it'll definitely help uh, the post-pandemic world. But Boom is a company founded by Blake Scholl. Uh, it actually went through uh, YC's uh, 2016 batch. And um, I really applaud Blake for sta uh, starting this company because if you think about it, Concord was launched in 1969. And after they retired, there was literally no one working on supersonic planes. And Blake took this project on pre-pandemic simply because he's always been an airplane enthusiast. And it really, uh, and you know, he worked at Amazon. He's a tech startup entrepreneur. He's founded two startups, but he was quite dissatisfied with the level of innovation in airplanes. And so the first jet um, that Boom assembled, the prototype, it's a uh, hundred and, I mean, they built it in four years. It's a $150 million jet. So literally they raised money. It was not easy to raise because everyone is chasing B2B software. Startups, no one wants to really invest in the hard things. But think about it. This was not possible even a decade ago. But in four years, they fully assembled the jet. They had an unveiling last year. They have announced a huge United partnership. But you know, I'm really excited for the potential of Boom. So what is Boom's idea? Concord already existed. So what is Boom's idea? Well, Concord did not work because of how expensive the plane was to fly. But since 1969 to 2016, there were lots of innovation that has happened in materials, in carbon composites, in jet engines, in ergonomics. So Blake's vision was, he really studied the space and he, his vision is that you can actually build a supersonic jet today at least at 50 to 75% cost cheaper than what it took the Concorde. And if you can pull that off, then the price of a seat on a supersonic plane is really the business class price. And there'll be more people to afford that, right? So think about it, New York to London in three and a half hours, you could do an entire business meeting and be back in time for dinner at home. And so that's the vision he's working towards. Um, what's that, so what, give us the probabilities today. What's the probability in the next decade that we're gonna fly on a supersonic jet uh, produced by, by Boom? Well, fingers crossed. I'm hoping they're aiming to have this flying by 2029. So I definitely hope it's happening in the next decade. Um, and, you know, if anything, I'm more excited that someone is actually working on it. So I spent a bunch of my day today uh, uh, with one of our investments at the Investor Day for Roblox. Um, and, you know, I, I would say over the last nine months, I've spent more time um, probably the, it, 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 down the rabbit hole of blockchain, crypto, and metaverse than almost any other topic um, that I'm covering. I know that you're spending a lot of time there as well. So I want to talk about that um, in, in the context of travel and tourism, um, because I think there's a, 
you know, there was this consensus view. You know, we saw a lot of spoofing. You probably saw the Iceland mm -hmm. uh, tourism yeah. video, uh, which was just a, it was just beautiful as a piece of art. Um, but, you know, spoofing this idea of like what losers want to sit around with headsets on when you can travel and be part of the real world. Um, my own view is that th this is about, uh, you know, really allowing more people to experience more of the real world in a more immersive way, not the other way around. Um, but I'm curious, if we look at the next batch of YC startups, of uh, those 15,000 applications, how what percentage of those are going to be metaverse or blockchain related? Well, the blockchain related applications are definitely a large number now and yeah. increasingly a large number. I mean, some of our portfolio companies are Coinbase, OpenSea, Dharma. We already have a you know, a long list of crypto companies that have gone through YC. Uh, we don't necessarily, I mean, to answer your question directly, I would say, what's new about the metaverse? Well, we've read about the metaverse. I mean, there have been Ready Player One, Snow Crash. Anyone in the gaming world can really talk to you about metaverse in length. But what's new? Uh, why now? Why are we talking about this now? I think the pandemic really accelerated this. I mean, um, I was joking with Brad that we are the only two people virtually talking in this conference. So you could almost say, is this the sort of metaverse? But I think we've all understood that we can get a lot done online without being confined to our physical spaces. Physical space is no longer a constraint. We don't need to be in the same city. And if you and think about our kids, you know, they grow up, they're gonna grow up in the online world. Even when I talk to a lot of YC founders in the current batch who are 23, 24, they grew up in Minecraft and Roblox. They don't know another world. But the challenge with Minecraft and Roblox, it was really hard to make a real human connection, right? Versus the metaverse enables you to do that. So Gather Town, which is, started, which is a YC company started by uh, Philip Wong and three other founders, um, it was really with this vision, you know, they've been working on a virtual reality headset for a while, but in 2020, right when the pandemic hit, they decided that, you know, we've been thinking about this the, the wrong way. We're thinking about this as having a virtual reality headset to have a metaverse. Instead, they said the need of the hour is to help create tools so that people can have real connections on virtually, like on Zoom or in a, in, a, in a virtual setting. So what Gather did is they built a 2D map, very simple 2D map, and they launched it in universities for any academic conference. And it was a real immersive experience because if you were going to a conference, you would run into people in real life. You could never run into someone on Zoom, right? But you on Gather, you could. So if you host a conference on Gather, you can run into people because you, anybody within 10 seconds of you, they, the video will pop up and you can say, oh, hi, I haven't seen you in a while, right? So that's an immersive experience. They then launched a remote work product. So they literally have an entire office map created on Gather. And there are many, there are like 50 YC companies that are using Gather to create, build their own offices. And what I've seen is when I interact with those founders, they don't talk it as talk about it as a virtual space. They literally tell me, I've moved my office. Do you want to see what my new office looks like? And I'm literally on the web-based app, walking around with them and you know, experiencing their entire office setup, which has chairs, desks, people log in every day, they're sitting next to each other. So I think that it's very important if we are going to work in this virtual world, the metaverse is important to help create that immersive experience. I don't think it replaces travel. As we talked about, I think travel is actually gonna see a huge boom because if everyone's gonna work from home or a large portion is gonna work from anywhere, you're gonna see people you know, sitting in Japan and still joining the virtual remote office setup, uh, which, you know, and, and it can feel like you're working in the same company. Yeah, I think that's right. I, you know, maybe a couple observations because I wanna reserve a little bit of time for questions. Um, one is, I think of it as just augmented experiences. So if I'm an advertiser in the room at Focusrite and I want to advertise on Instagram, right? Today, it, it's kind of what we're experiencing right now, Anu. This is a flat 2D experience. I can see that there's a room uh, at Focusrite filled with people. It's like a rock concert almost, like they are you know, <laughs> on their feet cheering. It's packed, standing room only. And if we were, if we could, you know, augment our experience, we could actually be on the stage and we could be looking at that. 
as opposed to looking at these two flat, you know, flat screens. And I think if you just think about the number, the billions of Zoom hours that are consumed every year, if we can make those 10% better, right? They, they feel 10% more in person, it dramatically increases, right? Productivity and happiness. I would say a second thing is, you know, it, most of the discovery I have about places I wanna travel today occurs on Instagram. I see a picture of a friend who's in an incredible place. I see a location that's advertising. But again, I wanna immediately get more information, right? If there was a way for me to click on something that was immediately an immersive experience, right? Where maybe I could stand in that place for 60 seconds. It's not that that scratches the itch, but then it says, oh yes, now I'm definitely hooked. I want to go there. I'll go ahead and book my hotel now. I'll go ahead and book my flight now. I'll make plans in my family's calendar now. Um, so I, I'm super excited when you look at the real life avatars that Roblox rolled out today, Epic's rolling out, Meta's rolling out. I, I, you know, our ability to have a digital persona that is our work persona, our play persona, et cetera, and to participate in this digital world, which is not isolating, but participatory. Um, I think is, you know, we've been talking about it for 15 years. I think, you know, the energy and technology is finally there. Maybe talk for a second, um, you know, let's shift and talk about Web3. And I'll use this anecdote that only a couple of people in the room there may remember. You know, for me, the centralizing, um, you know, uh, thread of Web3 and blockchain um, is this idea that kind of communities can own the value they create. Right. And so if you look at Axie International, um, you know, one of the biggest games, two and a half million daily gamers, um, you know, the, the company only takes four percent scrape. There's not even really, you, you know, uh, the organization takes a four percent scrape in order to pay for the utilities. But the value of what's created in Axie goes to the token holders. Right. It goes to the people who are playing the game. And I think all of our social networks, I think most of our games are going to be rebuilt on a web three based kind of theory and, 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 and blockchain. I remember in 1998, David Miranda, the founder of a company called Travel Zoo, had this, had this idea that everybody who participated in Travel Zoo, he'd give a share of common stock to. And he said, shouldn't they own the stock? They're the ones who are creating the value of the community. And in many respects, when you go to a crypto conference today, that's the same ethos. It's that you know these are the people creating the axes. So rather than Mark Zuckerberg or rather than you know, Roblox or rather than Epic owning it, shouldn't the players own it? And so I'm wondering, um, as you think about those, uh, you, you know, the application of that, are you starting to see DAOs and other deconstructed organization, you know, that are using tokens as their principal method for raising capital, um, you know, be pitched at YC? Um, and, 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 you know, um, I don't know, just, just go ahead and riff yeah. on that for a second. Um, yeah, I think it's still an evolving space. I think, do we believe that decentralization is important? We do. I mean, I think that even in the context of the metaverse, uh, I don't think we should be uh, striving to build another Facebook where one person decides the fate of 3 billion users, right? And I don't think, I'm not, I think that we accidentally ended up that way. But I think the founders of today are actively, proactively thinking about that. Uh, and they're very conscious of that. So I do think every founder is thinking about what layer of the stack should I decentralize and when to decentralize. But it's not as easy as it sounds. I guess so, what I, I guess what I was saying, Anu, is if I were sitting in that room today and I were starting TripAdvisor, mm -hmm. I would start it as a DAO. I would tokenize it, and everybody who participated in the TripAdvisor community, I would make a member. And I would, you know, they would own a TripAdvisor token. Let's call it a trippy. Yeah. And, you know, so the value of all these trippies would effectively be the balance sheet for the company. And what happens is they've effectively disintermediated venture, right? The community is yeah. self-funding the enterprise and the community feels real ownership. And that creates this incentive mechanism to share where the social network now is, is, is really owned by the users. I don't know. I find it one of the most interesting kind of yeah. cultural, political and business organization phenomenons I can remember of the last you know, 15 years. I, I would say I maybe just leave with this and you can comment and then we'll turn over to five minutes of questions. But 
you know, a lot of people ask me about crypto and what have I, you know, do I own crypto and what do I think about blockchain? I would say that, um, you know, crypto really spent eight years wandering a bit in the wilderness and we all co co conflate it with like a, a currency that's trying to rival the dollar. You know, for me, Web3 really is a technology evolution on, you know, the, the original internet protocol that allows for the exchange of value in a fundamentally different way, right? For us to have a ledger, for mm -hmm. us to have a, you know, a database with state that tracks prior activity and unleashes a whole new set of activities. So we're investing, you know, and, and quite excited about it, irrespective of whether you think the value of Bitcoin is going to go up or down. Yeah. Right. I think the value of the blockchain as a technical advancement for, um, uh, you know, building and organizing, it, you know, seems pretty profound to me. What, what are your thoughts? No, I think we've always believed that. And in fact, we think that the, the blockchain is the reason why you're able to pull that off. Right. Imagine if the value uh, of a lot of Internet applications also went to the people who built TCP IP. It didn't right. happen. But the blockchain world enables that. But I think there is a tension which we have seen even among the crypto companies on whether to do that from day one or whether to build that as a centralized system first and then figure out to decentralize. Why is that? Uh, when we spend time with the founders, the speed of decision-making and the speed with which they can roll out features and how they get locked into architectures are really important decisions. And starting out decentralized has its own pros and cons was a starting out centralized, and but building it in a way such that you are conscious of decentralizing it over time uh, is the other approach I've seen founders take as well. So there is still a tension because when you have thousands of people working on the same problem with different incentives, how do you roll out a product roadmap and get everyone aligned and move forward in what is going to launch when? There still seems to be a tension and a stage. It's not that it can't be done. It's just what stage of the company or its evolution of service can you actually do that? Incredible. Well, I, I just want to end by, and we'll, we'll take a question or two, but thanking you, Anu, um, not only one of the best investors in Silicon Valley, an incredible uh, leader of, of, of making sure that women are better represented on boards, better represented in cap tables, more women founders, um, and you know, a super friend to, to me. So thanks for joining us at Focusrite. Um, kick it back to you guys if there's a question or two. Hey, Brad, it's Steve After. How are you doing? Uh, <laughs> great to see you, Steve. <laughs> First off, I'm going to need my fucking vest back. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, no, uh, great conversation, Anu. Thank you so much. I was just curious, Brad, uh, the virtual Brad is not quite the pull on the audience that the in-person Brad is. I was wondering, and Focus Right asked me to, to, to put this question to you. Are we going to see you next year at uh, Focus Ride in Scottsdale? Yeah, we're, come, we're, we're taking the Oculus off, Steve. We're coming back. You and I are going to drive, uh, drive our Hummer on some golf course in Scottsdale next year. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Looking first. forward to it. <laughs> hey, Brad. Hey, Anu. Uh, Charuta Fadness from Focus Right. So, Anu, I have a, a question for you. You said you're getting a lot more applications, 15,000 or so per batch. Your acceptance rate is going down. How's your criteria change when you're actually evaluating these applications? I mean, focus right. We have a lot of startups uh, that that come to us. We have a startup program, so I, I think it'd be interesting to hear your take on what you're looking for and how that's changed. What what separates the best companies, the ones you select, from the ones that perhaps don't get selected? Yeah, surprisingly, our criteria hasn't changed. And this is the best part about YC, working at YC, because we do have 16 years of data, and I can look even the Airbnb application from 2008 and tell you what did they answer in that application and how did we as interviewers think about them. The application has largely remained the same. We really look for only two or three things. Our number one focus is the team. So we're looking at uh, how good is the team? Uh, do they really, do they have a unique insight about the problem that they're trying to solve? So the startup idea. And so there are different ways we ask the same question. So we kind of know, do they actually have a unique insight or not? Uh, we also test for how well the co-founders know each other. And since we predominantly do invest in tech startups, we're looking for, uh, is there at least one member of the co-founding team that's very strong from a programming ability? That's it. It's been pretty much the exact same. What we have learned is, at that stage of the application, it's really hard to get this right. 
So many of our borderline yeses, which you know we usually say internally, you need a strong yes to get accepted. Many of our borderline yeses have turned out to be amazing companies. And so that's sort of why we owe it on ourselves to make sure we're supporting more of them and enhancing the bad sides. Thank you. And Brad, we'll see you here next year, for sure. I think uh, it, looks like, it looks like our time's up, Anu, but uh, thank you all for having us and uh, look forward to being there in person next year. Thank you all. Thank you, Brad. <laughs>